So the next ones up are CO2 is more important than oxygen and nitric oxide is an unhealthy stress chemical. So these concepts are so fundamentally opposite to what we're taught, especially the first one, right? If you ask people what is the most important nutrient and then they kind of get their head around it, they probably go, oh, it's oxygen, right? Number one thing is oxygen because you only go a few minutes without breathing. Number two is water because you only go a few days without water and then all the rest is a lot longer, right? So oxygen seems like the most important nutrient. Um, so the idea of carbon dioxide being more important than oxygen is kind of saying it's the most important nutrient of all. Um, some people actually class it as a hormone. I don't know if Dr. Pete does. Uh, I think that's uh, you know a valid definition of uh, carbon dioxide or CO2. CO2 is actually one of the most beneficial things in the body. And it's quite hilarious that you know, there's this effort to demonize it as a bad thing in the environment, because not only is it one of the most essential things in the human body, it's also the most essential thing, arguably, well, along with sunlight and water, for helping plants grow, right? And as carbon dioxide increases in the ap atmosphere, plants grow more and more. And as CO2 increases in the human body, it has lots of beneficial effects as well, which we'll talk about. So how is it beneficial? Let's start with, like, my understanding before I came across Dr. Pete, and then we'll add Dr. Pete's understanding. So I first came across this concept from uh, Dr. Buteyko. Dr. Buteyko is uh, was a Russian scientist, and he observed that the more that people had, the higher, he was a pulmonary um, uh, scientist. He would uh, uh, check people's breathing, basically, in a medical context. And he would see the extre two extremes. He would work with like astronauts and athletes who were like the very highest level of pulmonary function. And then he'd also work with people who were, you know, dying of pulmonary disease of various kinds and, you know, struggling to breathe. And he observed a very interesting correlation, which is that the more that people breathed, the sicker they got up until and including the point that they stopped breathing altogether. And the less that they breathed, the healthier that they were. Can you, does that mean like in the more breaths during like the minute that they're taking to breathe or what's the distinction, uh, the definition of that? Literally filling up a bag, how much of a bag you would fill up with how much you're exhaling. Because obviously if you're- Right, right, the volume. volume. Yeah, absolutely volume, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I think, in fact, uh, I might have misremembered this, I didn't look it up for years, but I think it's something like, maybe six liters you'd consider really great. And then like 12 was more common when people are unhealthy. But the one thing I, that I do remember is, so this is what he observed. So therefore he would see that the more that people were able to hold their breath, the healthier that they were. And so people who were in the brink of dying and it wasn't just a pulmonary disease, it could be any disease. They would be able to hold their breath for a few seconds without desperately gasping. People who are like, peak you know level of uh, uh strength and vitality they could hold their breath for maybe easily 60 seconds without effort and so that he ended up calling the control pause uh basically what the way that you measure your own control pause is you take a little breath in you breathe out but don't push any air out just let your lungs relax so half a breath out and then you basically just hold your breath and you get a stopwatch and you see how many seconds you can hold it before you feel any kind of significant desire to breathe. And so he had a very really simple chart for it. He said, if you're, if the amount of time you can hold it easily is between zero and 10 seconds, you're probably already sick. If it's between 10 and 20 seconds, you're probably on the verge of getting sick. Like you, you probably get sick frequently or, you know, it doesn't take much. If it's between 20 and 40 seconds, then you're probably, you know, averagely healthy, like okay, but can be taken down without too much trouble. If you're between 40 and 60, you're pretty strong. And from his perspective, you're, if you're above 60 seconds, if you could genuinely hold your breath with no effort for more than 60 seconds in a relaxed way, then you'd be like superhuman from his point of view. Um, so that was his experience. There's a whole system behind it called the Buteyko method that people still do and teach to this day. It has not caught on massively despite being very effective for a lot of things the usually the main thing it's used for is asthma it's very effective for that but it's actually very effective for a whole range of different health issues uh but it his system not dr pete's but his system dr buteyko is required like practicing holding your breath for a long time which is actually very very difficult and so anything that requires uh, an extensive amount of 
effort, discipline, exertion, and overcoming resistance tends to not <laughs> get a lot of mass appeal, at least unless there's kind of a status <laughs> thing, right? I guess people love to like do intensive exercise, but then often it's a lot of showing off. And, you know, if you say, oh, I held my breath for 60 seconds today, no one's going to go, oh, well done. So there's not really any status around it and uh, it's very difficult. So it's never really caught on. But anyway, what's the science behind it and how does it relate to Dr. Pete? So Chrissy, you probably know the answer to this as a, you know, based on context, but like if you hold your breath, what is the thing that tells you I need to breathe now? What is the mechanism? Oh, if, I mean, I don't really, for me, it's the, it's the pressure of the buildup of, of the, yeah, the buildup of the carbon dioxide in the body that's Correct. building up that tells me I need to breathe. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. You know the answer. <laughs> uh, most people though think that it's lack of oxygen, right? If I hold my breath for too long, I need to breathe. Why? Because I'm running out of oxygen. So the key thing to understand is this thing called uh, the, the Bohr effect, B-O-H-R, that was invented in 1904. And what Dr. Bohr discovered is that in order for oxygen to get from the blood, red blood cells, which, so the oxygen goes into your lungs, for the lungs, it goes into the red blood cells, the red blood cells through the whole cardiovascular system, transport the oxygen throughout the body, but then to get it from those red blood cells into every other cell, it requires carbon dioxide. And so if you have, if you do not have sufficient carbon dioxide to go from the red blood cells into every other cell, that means that that cell has to start making do without carbon dioxide, sorry, without oxygen or with less oxygen. And so it can do that. It can do anaerobic respiration. It can do anaerobic energy creation through various different mechanisms, but none of them are as energy efficient and none of them are as, uh, you know, involve the fastest, strongest, highest level of metabolism, which is why Dr. Pete was fundamentally against all of them because optimizing metabolism was really, I would say, the centerpiece of his whole philosophy. So now here's the thing. The higher stress chemicals the more that you have an intolerance to carbon dioxide, the more that you feel that the same level of carbon dioxide is intolerable to you and you have to breathe more. And people get into a kind of loop with this and at the extreme, this is called hyperventilating. So hyperventilating people, <laughs> right? Because they're just trying to get out as much CO2 as possible. Now, when someone is hyperventilating, what's the usual advice they give you? Get a paper bag, right? And blow into that. Why? Because then you're not losing the carbon dioxide. You keep breathing it back in again because you're breathing into a bag. So it's kind of trying to break that cycle. Now, other than this effect of being crucial from tra to transporting oxygen from the, um, from the red blood cells into every other cell, the other thing that's so important about carbon dioxide is, is the number one way that your body relaxes the whole cardiovascular system. So dilates and opens your arteries, your capillaries, your blood vessels, and all the rest of it. So what you're saying, you're saying CO2 is what dilates the capillaries and not, it's not, not because I always thought it was nitric oxide. So you're saying it's CO2? It's definitely CO2. Uh, this is one of the craziest things about science. It's it's up there. Uh, to me, it's, it's just as crazy as a lot of the other things we've talked about, like almost everyone starving for fire aid or people poisoning themselves of estrogen, um, is believing that CO2 is a bad thing when in fact it is you know, one of the number one things that is beneficial for your body. So that's why I added the other quote about nitric oxide being bad for you. Dr. Pete firmly believed that nitric oxide is a stress gas. It is a gas that it is a secondary backup system from Dr. Pete's point of view, which is used in certain circumstances, which I'll talk about in a second. But generally, you should have sufficient carbon dioxide to keep all of those arteries and blood vessels and all the rest open. And the nitric oxide from his point of view, and I agree with this, is a emergency backup way of opening those blood vessels to keep you alive, but it's not the primary way that that should be going on. 
Now, what I didn't learn from Dr. Buteyko, but which I learned from Dr. P, is exactly why and how CO2 is so beneficial. Why Dr. Buteyko was right that those people who could barely hold their breath for a few seconds were probably you know very ill versus the people who could hold it for a long long time were probably very strong and resilient and not ill is because carbon dioxide is mainly created when your body is doing when your body is creating energy when your body is creating atp in the optimal way so when your body is creating atp using the krebs cycle and it's uh, going through the electron transport chain. It's doing the whole thing that means you get, um, uh, I think it's almost 30 units of ATP from, from two units of glucose, so the abundance of ATP. When it's doing it that way, the two byproducts are water and carbon dioxide. Now, from a normal medical perspective, it's a waste byproduct but the interesting thing that dr pete said and again this is not a theory there's abundance of science behind this is that the higher that co2 remains the more that the body stays in that high metabolism efficient optimal energy producing state whereas the more that you're depleted of co2 the more it goes into its backup state and based on what I said earlier about Dr. Buteyko, the reason for this should be obvious if you're joining the dots, because all of those backup, less efficient energy producing systems tend to be anaerobic or they're less aerobic, so meaning less oxygen. So basically, that CO2 that you're creating is not a waste product, although you do need to blow off the excess, obviously, but it's not a waste product because you need a certain amount to get the oxygen back into the cells for the next round of energy production. And if you keep blowing off that CO2 excessively because your stress chemicals are too high, which means that you're overbreathing or hyperventilating, then you don't have enough CO2 transporting enough oxygen into the cells. Your cells are going to be creating energy for an inefficient mechanism. They're going to produce less CO2 as a byproduct, and you're stuck in this vicious circle. And when there's less CO2 floating around, then you're going to be in a state of hypertension or closer to it. If all other things be equal, I mean, there are adrenal issues and stuff that can mean you've got all that bad stuff going on. You still are not having high blood pressure, but generally it leads to high blood pressure. And then the body has nitric oxide as an emergency backup system to deal with that, but nitric oxide has its own issues. So I think at that point, let's go to what Dr. Pete said about CO2. Absolutely. It says, the basic control of blood flow in the brain is the result of the relaxation of the wall of blood vessels in the presence of carbon dioxide, which is produced in proportion to the rate at which oxygen and glucose are being metabolically combined by active cells. In the inability of cells to produce CO2 at a normal rate, nitric oxide synthesis in blood vessels can cause them to dilate. The mechanism of relaxation by nitric oxide is very different, however, involving the inhibition of mitochondrial energy production. Situations that favor the production and retention of larger amounts of carbon dioxide in the tissues are likely to reduce the basic tone of the parasympathetic nervous system, and there is less need for additional vasodilation. Okay, so I kind of already said all that, but he said it in the proper science way. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at a couple of bits of that. So the mechanism of relaxation by nitric oxide is very different involving the inhibition of mitochondrial energy production. And again, he gives a you know scientific reference in that quote. Um, so meaning if you're using CO2, that helps with mitochondrial energy production. But if you're using nitric oxide, it actually slows down mitochondrial energy production. So it actually makes it worse. Um, the other thing he said is that large amounts of carbon dioxide in this tissues are likely to reduce the basic tone of the parasympathetic nervous system. So basically, um, if you have enough carbon dioxide, you stay relaxed. That's the other uh, uh, part of it. And so this, in my view, is one of the reasons that exercise is often, but not always, as we'll talk about next, healthy for people so the main way that we produce carbon dioxide uh, more than usual well there's two ways we can kind of build up carbon dioxide in the system one is to hold our breath 
Uh, most people don't do that, although there is a theory that people are actually doing that unconsciously and that that's the real cause of sleep apnea. The body is holding the breath, not because it's trying to kill you, but because it's trying to build up the carbon dioxide because it's getting so low that it's actually an issue. Um, so that's a theory. But the other main way that we build up carbon dioxide is exercise. That's why when you're running or whatever you're doing, you breathe more, right? You may be out of breath, you may be puffing and panting and all the rest of it. If you're pushing yourself hard, that's simply a response to the carbon dioxide, right? There's nothing else that you're doing there other than just getting rid of what feels like an excess of carbon dioxide. Very good. Yeah, that's whew, lots. So he carries on to say nitric oxide is increasingly seen as an important factor in nerve degeneration. Nitric oxide activates processes that can lead to cell death. Inhibition on the production of nitric oxide protects against various kinds of dementia. Brain trauma causes large increase in nitric oxide formation and blocking its synthesis improves recovery. Yeah, and so every statement you made there, obviously we're not going to read it out, but there's studies behind it right so all of these bad things that excess nitric oxide is actually doing and so how have we come to this idea that you just said chrissy that nitric oxide is the thing that dilates the blood vessels well as i said technically it's true it does it's just that it does it in a bad way so where's this come from it came from the discovery of viagra in the 80s um which has been used you know later also for cardiovascular health by a lot of people including even some biohackers who really should know better but they don't understand it's actually the, uh, the backup system. So whereas carbon dioxide has this anti-inflammatory ox uh, metabolism boosting energy producing benefit, nitric oxide is the opposite. However, um, nitric oxide is often related to being in this excite excitatory state, right? And so one area where nitric oxide absolutely is required is for mental interaction. So, you know, uh, that's, I've got, uh, you know, a herbal product for that. And I stand by that for that very specific purpose. Nitric oxide is necessary and is effective. However, should men be walking around with one of those 24 hours a day? Absolutely not. So this is a thing where a little bit of poison is no big deal, right? A little bit of nitric oxide, whatever it is, an hour a day or however much you're erect, that's absolutely fine. Your body can deal with that. But having that be the only thing that stops you being hypertensive 24 hours a day, that's not a good thing. So that's the distinction. And so you could even make the argument of Viagra. There's nothing wrong with that. It lasts for a few hours, use it every now and then. That's okay. It's not the end of the world. But when people are kind of trying to constantly boost nitric oxide to open the blood vessels, to me, that seems like a, a, a really bad idea when you look into the actual science behind it. Um, Dr. Pete goes on to say, organophosphates increase nitric oxide formation and the productive anticholinergenic drugs such as atropine reduce it. Stress, including fear and isolation, can activate the formation of nitric oxide and various mediators of inflammation also activate it. The nitric oxide in a person's exhaled breath can be used to diagnose some diseases and it probably reflects the level of their emotional well-being. So whereas the level of CO2 is a way of diagnosing health from this perspective, it being higher being good because it means you must be able to retain most of it rather than you know, blowing out excessively in a, um, in a hyperventilating way. So nitric oxide is actually literally the opposite. So if this is the case, why do people favor nitric oxide other than maybe brainwashing by the uh, pharmaceutical industries? I think it's actually for the reason that it's said. So if I just go back to it, stress, including fear, can activate the formation of nitric oxide. So you've got to remember, and we've talked about this a lot in other episodes on stress, people like the feeling of stress often when the alternative is a feeling of depression and deflation and, and being a low in energy, right? So just a reminder, there's three kind of basic modalities of the nervous system. One is a dorsal vagal mode where we feel shut down. The other is a sympathetic mode where we feel overstimulated. And the third is a ventral vagal mode where we feel relaxed yet energized. So a lot of people, a lot of the time are in a shutdown state or probably not in a shutdown state, but resisting a shutdown state, right? Like, um, you know, I hear this a lot in people and they're like, oh, I can't stop because if I do, I'll collapse, you know, I'll fall asleep. Like, I've got to keep going, I've got to keep going, I've got to keep going. So anyone who has that attitude, I've got to have another coffee, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, like, I can't stop because if I do, I'll collapse, which is a lot of people, 
that is that attitude of I need to fight that dorsal vagal state off. And so when that's your m mode of being, which is very common, and again, I'm not making anyone wrong for this because often this starts because of the stuff we've talked about, lack of thyroid hormone, excess of estrogen, lack of progesterone, lack of testosterone, um, excess of inflammation, excess of seed oils, et cetera, et cetera, and many other things, all of that stuff. But once you're in that state, stress feels good because the alternative is collapse or, or you know, uh, uh, depression or whatever you want to call it, which feels bad. So I think that's why people like nitric oxide. But the thing that actually will get you out of that vicious circle of going between collapse and overstimulation, a piece of it actually is carbon dioxide. And so learning to tolerate carbon dioxide is good. Dr. Pete, as far as I'm aware, did not uh, talk about and recommend Buteco breathing practices. I don't know why I haven't seen him comment on it, but if I had to guess, I would guess this because the main mechanism that um, Buteco breathing practices use to help you to tolerate more CO2, which is a good thing, but the mechanism they use is to get you to hold your breath for a really, really, really long time until you absolutely feel like you can't anymore, which they call the maximum pause as opposed to the control pause. And often you're holding your breath for like several minutes, many minutes. I got to the point where I could hold my breath for three minutes from cold without any preparation. Um, but I'll tell you what that does when you hold your breath for such a long time, it triggers stress chemicals. And Dr. Pete was not keen on that. So his method of boosting carbon dioxide was different. He would encourage people not to over breathe, certainly, but he was not necessarily encouraging people to hold their breath for a very long time. He encouraged them to obviously get into this high metabolism state where you are producing ATP in optimal way because that will naturally raise carbon dioxide anyway. And he also actually experimented with increasing CO2 in the environment um, and potentially even bathing in it. So doing like a, um, I don't actually know if he did this, but I know one of his biggest followers like has a whole book on bath bombs and it's basically adding sodium bicarbonate and an acid like citric acid to a bath. And then when you do that, it creates, there's loads of CO2 in the atmosphere. The amount of CO2 in the atmosphere will go like 10 times. But actually, there's all the CO2 bubbles in the bath itself. And it doesn't have to be a whole bath. If you don't have a bath, you can just do a foot bath. It's still good. And these little two, CO2 bubbles, just like if you drink sparkling water, they'll, um, you know, uh, um, what's the word? Collect on the surface of your skin. And then they'll be absorbed transdermally through your skin straight into circulation. So if you if you want to do it in a relaxed way, you know, warm bath, you know, the candles, music, whatever, right? You can be super, super relaxed and then still really saturate your body in CO2. And I'm actually a big fan of that. I really like doing it. I know we still have our list, but I, and maybe this might be for another time because Wim Hof is big out there in breath and holding breath and things like that. Is that similar to Pateco? Is it different? Um, where does it fall on those lines? Yeah, it's a good question. So Wim Hof is absolutely not similar to Pateco. Like any Pateco practitioner would say it's not because Wim Hof tells you to do something that all Pateco people tell you to never do, which is hyperventilate. But I think in, there is genius to Wim Hof's breathing because what he's really encouraging you to do is to go between the extremes of hyperventilating, so blowing out all the CO2, and then holding your breath and building up the CO2. And if you notice with a Wim Hof breathing pan, it always ends with holding the breath. So it's CO2 right down, CO2 right up, CO2 right down, CO2 right up, CO2 right down, CO2 up. That's what's going on. Now, another thing that's going on with that, which he talks about a lot and the scientists who work with him, is that it's spiking the hell out of the stress chemicals. Yeah. The cortisol, yeah, the adrenaline, yeah. the noradrenaline. Is that a good thing overall? I don't think that that settled in either direction, although, of course, adherents of either side would say that it is. But I think it ultimately depends on what you want to do with your life. I think if you want to do the kind of superhuman stuff that, you know, um, Wim Hof has done, it proven in the laboratory condition, but also, you know, many other mystics and monks and all the rest of it throughout the ages have been reported to do. If you want to do that supernatural stuff, you do have to be very, very good at controlling your body's internal processes that are normally automatic. And one of those things would be to manipulate stress chemicals, sometimes to be extremely high. It's not necessarily bad for you to do what he does, because the theory behind it is that you're, yes, you are skyrocketing the stress chemicals, but then they can go back down again. 
and they can actually you know find an equ equilibrium it depends what you have to do you know let's i would say the wim hof method of uh i notice it tends to be more attractive to men than women although there's plenty of women involved but still most kind of health groups there's more women than men in the wim hof health groups there tends to be more men than women and i don't think that's an accident i think it's because you know one of the things that people say when they do wim hof breathing is something similar that people say when they do fighting which is like it makes it everything else seems quite easy to deal with in comparison it's like you're you're toning that sympathetic response to the point where like you're able to deal with even highly stressful situations very well so if you're in a context of i need to climb a mountain like mount everest or in the context of i need to be in battle i need to risk my life i think those kind of practices are very beneficial because they make you very strong and resilient and hardy because you're the master of your own stress chemicals however what if it's peacetime what if you don't want to climb up mount everest in your shorts what if there are no battles what if you just want to live long and be happy and relaxed and peaceful and joyful and play with your kids? And, you know, not all of us have that luxury, but let's say you are in an environment where you have that luxury. Then it could be argued that it's not beneficial to do these things to spike your stress chemicals because they're just going to prematurely age you still, potentially. And if nothing else, they're going to stop you from having that optimal energy production. I've had rumors, which I won't repeat here, but I don't know if they're true, but that Wim Hof struggled with his own issues, despite, you know, being a master in, in some ways that, you know, he's extremely impressive to everyone, definitely including me. Um, so it's a choice. You know, do you want to master your stress chemicals or do you want to stop living in a stress state? Some will say it's a false choice. No, by they would say by Wim Hof method, you master your stress chemicals, which will stop you being a stress state. But I remember one of the scientists um, in the documentary, you know, who's on his side, but talking about him, he said, you know, not only was his cortisol very high and his noradrenaline very high after he did his breathing practice, it was higher even when he just walked into the room, even before all that. Like, it just seemed to be high in general. And is that a good thing? Maybe. I think, you know, there is a certain point, like when you can control your own physiology and you can literally, you know, change your heart rate at will, change your CO2 concentration at will, change your adrenaline at will, change your level of lactic acid at will, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then it's just a choice what you do with it. So I wouldn't want to judge Wim Hof or anyone with that level of self-mastery. But I'll say for the average person who doesn't want to become superhuman it and who doesn't maybe want to harden themselves and strengthen themselves to you know, be able to thrive even in extreme duress, um, it might be better to just focus on optimizing your body's energy production rather than like making yourself super, super resilient to stress. Because by making yourself resilient to stress, you're also potentially filling your body's stress and prematurely aging yourself. We don't know that for sure. Wim Hof is, you know, still youngish. He's certainly not 80 or something, right? So he's not yet reached the average age that people die. So we don't know for sure. Maybe he'll live to be 150 and we're all completely wrong about this. I guess we'll see. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that clip from the Rejuvenate podcast. If you want to watch the full episode that that came from, just click on the link above. Or if you just want to watch our latest video, then click the link below. And make sure that you subscribe to the channel and like the video. Thank you.